ancient practice of presenting performances in individual modes, that is, individual maqams, transform into the system of linking several modes into collective units called a dasko. A similar transformation did not take place within the sister traditions of Turkey and the Arab world whose classical music shares common theoretical and to some extent historical backgrounds with that of Persia. In order to investigate this matter, we must bear in mind that Persian traditional music relates to social conditions markedly different from what we know today. It is the music of an age when the pace of life was much more leisurely. It is not a music for concert halls and is not intended to be listened to with, with rapt attention. It was heard on rare occasions in private gatherings and in intimate surroundings. It was bound to time values which were relaxed and flexible. A performance by a good musician in the past must have taken a considerable length of time. Short and separate pieces were not favored. If the performance was to remain within a single maram, then it had to include not only extensive improvisations, but also numerous preconceived compositions. This is how it was done, for example, in the Fasil of Turkish music. But it seems that in Persia, the art of composition, apart from improvisation, had been effectively lost. Fixed compositions by known compo composers did not figure in a musical performance. By the end of the 18th century, with political turmoil and instability which had reigned for nearly a century, together with oppressive social conditions and a breakdown in aristocratic patronage, musical literacy and scholarship had greatly suffered. It is possible that by this time, reduced creative versatility on the part of the performing musicians had made it difficult for them to present within a single maram a performance lasting a respectable length of time. This may indeed have been the reason for the gradual emergence of the practice of weaving a series of maqams together in, in what came to be known as a dasko, literally meaning a unit containing various components. By the way, I, I dispute any connection of the word dasko with other musical term, terminologies such as doga, sega, charga, etc. I don't think that uh, the word dasko has any meaning other than its application in other contexts in the Persian language. We say, for example, a dasko, automobile, dasko, apartment, meaning a unit which has other elements inside it. And I think in, in music, being a fairly recent application, the word dasko is a rather new thing in its musical application. I think it only means that and has no real connection with the ga as perhaps meaning place for position of the hand, as probably Doga, uh, Sega, and all the rest uh, refer to. In any event, it is clear that continuity with the past was broken. And the question of authenticity as regards any firm connections with pre-18th century practice is placed in serious doubt. By late 19th century, the Dasko system had become well established. But in its structure and details, the system was ill-defined and unstable. The radif of each Dasko, that is the various modes or the gouches included in each Dasko, was not clearly established. 
the radif of an individual musician could differ in number, order, and sometimes even the title of gouches from that of another musician. There was a consensus, however, which identified the entire corpus of traditional music as being contained within seven dasgahs and five lesser groupings called the five avas. Western cultural influences began to make a serious impact in the second half of the 19th century. In the sphere of music, Western influences were, were largely instigated by Nasreddin Shah's interest in ceremonial and military music at his court on European lines. By the way, some of the things I'm saying from this point on may tend to uh, uh, duplicate uh, remarks made by Dr. Ogre. He was entertained, uh, oh, during his uh, long reign uh, from 1848 to 96, this Shah visited Europe on three occasions. He was uh, entertained by European heads of states and at the official functions he attended, he had the opportunity of hearing military bands and orchestras. The favorable impression he had received prompted him to order the creation of means for the establishment of similar musical ensembles for functions at his own court. French music teachers were brought to Tehran and a, and a music school for the training of military band musicians was established. By the close of the 19th century, scores of players in the instruments of the mili uh, military band had been trained. This was a very limited channel for contact with Western music, yet it produced quite remarkable consequences, some of the more notable of which are the following. One, musical notation was never used in Persian music as the music was largely improvised. A few instances of musical notation found in medieval treatises were tools of theoretical argumentation and were not intended as means of conveying music for, from one person to another. No one ever performed music from any kind of notation. Now, in the context of the military band music, Western notation had to be used in order to learn existing pieces and to repeat them without alteration or interpolation. Two, rudiments of theory and harmony of Western music were taught and the students were introduced to the tempered tuning uh, system, major and minor scales, and the principles of practical harmony as needed in the training of band musicians. Three, Western instruments of the military band were imported and taught at the music school, such instruments being mainly woodwinds and brasses are ill-equipped to produce intervals peculiar to native music. Nevertheless, some of them were gradually brought into use in Persian music. Later, other instruments were also imported. The violin, in particular, found great favor as it can fully express the intervals and the nuances of native music. Even the piano, undoubtedly a most incompatible instrument to, with, with Persian music was also introduced and found wide application. Four, traditionally Persian music was learned as a practical art with private teachers. There was no uniform methodology of musical study. Any theoretical information was merely a byproduct of practical training and incidental to it. Moreover, it reflected the individual teacher's own views. The concept of a uniform, methodical, and scientifically based approach to the study of music, as done in the new school of music, made a significant impact. And five,
Given the central role of improvisation in Persian traditional music, the use of large ensembles proves impractical, if not impossible. Furthermore, the use of an orchestra can be hardly justified in a music which is essentially monophonic. Nevertheless, the colorfulness and the sheer richness of the sound of a Western orchestra was so alluring as to prompt the formation of ensembles for performance of Persian music with a mixture of Western and native instruments. This, in turn, led to the creation of a new genre of music suited to the needs of such ensembles. Early in the 20th century, <coughs> a number of musicians instituted reforms and introduced innovations which, to varying degrees, can be viewed as revolutionary. They were directly or indirectly influenced by aspects of Western music emanating from the activities of the aforementioned music school. One of the most important of these innovations was composition of fixed pieces. Within the parameters of Persian modes, but not subject to improvisation. An instrumental genre with a generic name Pish Daramad was created, which could be played by a solo instrument or by a group of instruments, as an overture before uh, improvisations in a given daska are to begin. Instrumental pieces were also composed in the old dance form called Reng. Similar to Pish Daramad, a Reng could be played as a solo number or by a group of instruments, but it usually was placed at the conclusion of the performance of the dasko. A vocal genre of composition called tasnif was also cultivated, which became particularly popular during the early parts of the century when the struggle for constitutional democracy was underway. All of these compositional forms betray Western influence as the very notion of a fixed composition, often written in Western notation, came about due, due to exposure to Western music. Another important development in early 20th century was in the realm of music theory. The most influential fig a musical figure in the first half of the century was Ali Nari Waziri. 1886 to 1981. He was the first Persian musician to seek a period of musical studies abroad. Already a highly accomplished performer of tar and setar, Vaziri went to France just before the outbreak of the First World War. By the time he returned to Tehran in early 20s, he had accumulated a wealth of knowledge in Western theory and in, in the principles of composition. He had also learned how to play the violin and the piano. An enormously energetic and charismatic man, over the next 20 years, Vaziri be became the country's most dominant musical personality. He established a, a music school of his own and set about training young musicians in Persian music, but according to Western methods. He saw himself as a true servant of national music by being its savior. In his view, Persian music had to be saved from stagnation, from an atmosphere of perpetual gloom and misery. His aim was to reform this music, to infuse it with pride and vigor, and to make it into a social force instead of a semi-furtive tool for expression of lost love and lamentation. Vaziri composed many pieces for solo instruments and for ensembles, as well as songs and even operettas. Most of his compositions are within Persian modes, but are often technically demanding and display heroic gestures, 
quite alien to the old style of Persian music. He also wrote duets employing techniques of Western harmony and counterpoint. Vaziri left his greatest mark <coughs> in the area of music theory. In a number of published books and articles, he espoused a new theory of Persian music which in no way was connected with any of the medieval theories. <coughs> Vaziri proposes that Persian music is founded on the division of the octave into 24 equidistant quartertones. It is hard to believe that Vaziri, a very sound musician and an extremely intelligent man, had really come to the conclusion that Persian music rests on a quarter-tone scale. In fact, no quarter-tone, no quarter-tones are to be found in Persian music at all. The intervals used in this music, other than the semitone and the whole tone, are larger than the former, but smaller than the latter. There is no logic for considering these neutral intervals as multiples of the quarter tone when that interval by itself has no application. One can only conclude that, that the 24 quarter tone scale was proposed by Vaziri as an artificial solution in order to make Persian music capable of adapting to a system of polyphony akin to the Western harmonic system, which is based on a scale of 12 equidistant semitones. <clears throat> Not only Vaziri, but many other musicians in the Middle East have viewed their monophonic musical traditions as implicitly inferior to the polyphonic music of the Western culture. They have advocated all manner of compromise in order to make their own music compatible with harmonization. This has invariably been seen as a needed reform and a step towards musical progress. In addition to uh, this artificial, his artificial core tone scale, Vaziri promulgated other unorthodox views and innovations which contravened the established tradition. He rejected the generally accepted categorization of the ra radif into seven dasgahs and five avazes. He only recognizes five dasgahs and the remaining seven he calls not avaz but nagmeh. Also, he altered the inter intervallic structure of the mode of Bayat Isfahan by microtonal raising of its seventh degree so that it may have a semitone relationship with the finalis, thereby duplicating a harmonic minor scale. Realizing that Persian traditional music is devoid of a true bass register, he invented a bass tar and also made use of the cello in some of his compositions. In some of his songs, he added a choral refrain, quite unprecedented in Persian traditional music. In his playing style, Vaziri emphasized technical dexterity and virtuosity, values of relatively minor significance to authentic music. Throughout the period between the two world wars, Vaziri remained in a position of preeminence precisely because of his Western outlook and his revolutionary reforms, which had in invested him with, an, with almost unassailable authority. He had many disciples among aspiring young musicians who fell under the spell of his powerful per personality. In time, his pupils and their pupils in turn became prominent musical figures in their own right. They have perpetuated Vaziri's theories and ideas to this day. The period between the two wars is also important <coughs> as the beginnings of the availability of recorded music and the coming of radio. 
It is a period when, for the first time, music was made available for mass consumption. Individual instrumentalists and singers emerged for the first time as public figures. Many of the early recordings were actually made by artists who, in, in the absence of recording facilities in Persia, were transported to Europe by record companies. These travels no doubt afforded the native musicians more opportunities to hear Western music. This is the period that, that piano begins to become popular. The adoption of this instrument is a good example of the indiscriminate acceptance of things Western. The intervals of Persian music cannot be properly obtained on, on the piano, even if one or two of the notes are altered in tuning. Furthermore, piano is manifestly an instrument designed for polyphonic music. It is sheer folly to put the piano in the service of monophonic music. In fact, what developed as the piano style of Persian music necessarily interjected into the music a certain amount of irrelevant chords and arpeggios, unusual, and usually in the left hand, while the right hand attempts to imitate the so-called riz strokes as done on the tar. Yet not one of even the most steadfast traditionalists seemed to be troubled by this misrepresentation of Persian music, to say nothing of the misuse of the instrument. Even the style of santur playing was affected by mannerisms of Persian piano play playing in the use of occasional scale runs and arpeggios, all of which is totally alien to authentic music. Following the Second World War until the revolution of 1978-79, Persia was open to Western influences on a wholesale basis. As concerns musical developments, this is the period that saw the full flower of commercialization of music. Recording industries, pop bands, pop singers, radio, television, and motion picture music uh, became lucrative business. Traditional musicians began to feel threatened. Many fell in line and took a share in the commercial music activity as performers and composers of popular songs. The compromises that had to be made were not seen as loss of artistic integrity. The general feeling seemed to be that so long that the music they play and the pieces that they compose remain related to the modes of the Dasko system, then it is authentic. A few, however, did not join the prevailing trends and showed concern over rapid change and the loss of standards. They were active primarily as teachers or performers on radio. The rampant westernization and commercialization of this period generated a reaction in favor of preservation of the purity of national heritage in every field, including music. Many intellectuals and some who were in position of power took up the cause of authenticity in all things Persian. Thus, the final decade of the monarchy can be seen as a period of resurgence of interest in the safeguard and promotion of native culture in its pure and authentic form. The most prominent and in many ways the most effective supporter of national causes was the Empress Farah. In music, the organization of national Iranian radio and television played a leading part in the protection and promotion of authenticity in national music. The Shiraz festival organized by the NIRT, National Iranian Radio and Television, made great efforts in presenting the purest of Persian traditional music as performed by the most respected proponents of this art. A center for preservation and promotion of national music was created by NIRT. One of the most committed champions of the traditional music, Nur Ali Burumand, 1904-77,
was brought to the center in order to teach master classes in tar and sitar and generally help the cause of national music by teaching the classical repertoire and the authentic style of its performance. <coughs> Concurrent with assuming responsibilities uh, at this center, Boruman was also given the newly created chair of Persian music at the University of Tehran. Accordingly, Mr. Boruman, in the final 10 years of his life, found an extended teaching forum, whereas earlier he was not widely known and had only taught a few pupils privately. In both these positions, he came in contact with an increasing number of students on whom he, he exerted great influence. Boruman was more of a teacher than a performer. <clears throat> he had uh, very firm and at times idiosyncratic views on the right and wrong of Persian music. His purest approach allowed for little display of sheer virtuosity. He be believed in rigid guidelines for improvisation, which tended to make for a less varied performance style. On the other hand, he had a very thorough knowledge of the traditional music. Blessed with a prodigious memory, Boruman was able to impart to his pupils a very complete radif for each dasko. He also knew by heart old tasnifs which seemed to have been forgotten by nearly everyone else. By mid-1970s, a number of Boruman's talented pupils had made their way into musical prominence and were beginning to attract public following. Among them were, uh, there were some who had learned the radif very uh, well, but uh, at the same time were more imaginative and more creative than their, their teacher. Their performance style, while remaining faithful, two minutes. Uh, uh, while remaining faithful to the ideals of purity is more individualistic and dynamic. This is particularly true of those who have also shown an admirable aptitude for composition. Notable among them are Muhammad Reza Lotfi and Hussein Ali Zadeh, as you mentioned. Since the revolution of 1978-79, Lutfi and Alizadeh have made significant contributions both as composers and performers. Their compositions represent a more modern or, shall we say, progressive style, rooted in the modes of the Das Gauss, but with, uh, uh, w uh, but with striking innovations in range of dynamics use of varied rhythms, contrasting sections, extended tonal range, and the employment of large and colorful ensembles made of exclusively native instruments. It may be ironic uh, that the present theocratic regime in the Islamic Republic of Iran, who began with a very proscriptive attitude and harsh measures against music, has gradually created, perhaps un unintentionally, a favorable ambiance for the promotion of national music and for musical creativity, unhindered by obtrusive foreign influences. Since there appears to be an official ban on pop music of all variety, it is the traditional music as well as Western classical music which receive public exposure. Major figures of traditional music are enjoying recognition and are given ample platform for their art to be appreciated. Also, a number of talented composers are creating a new genre of music which aims to reach beyond the confines of the Dasko system and shows its national identity by more oblique methods, such as the use of native instruments and folk rhythms. It is highly possible that, as has been the case with cinema gifted young musicians in Persia through the creative enterprise shall distinguish themselves in, in a way that may surprise everyone, most of all the religious authorities in Tehran. 